I just bought a 3D printer, and it was probably much easier to get, set up, and use than you might think. Let's talk about it. Today, I want to talk all about 3D printing, how it works, and if you're interested, how you can pick it up as a hobby. When I was a kid, I thought 3D printers were some magical machine like the replicators from Star Trek where you could just 3D print a sword or something in two seconds or make a whole new 3D printer just using your 3D printer. But while their uses are much, much more limited than I thought as a kid, it doesn't mean that they're not really cool and it doesn't mean that there's still not a ton of things that you can do with a 3D printer. So without further ado, let's go into exactly how a 3D printer works. First, let me share with you a hypothetical. Let's say I asked you to build me a block letter K like this standing up on a table and all I gave you to do that was a hot glue gun. How might you go about it? Well, you might draw two squares on the table and then draw two more squares on top of that and two more and more and more until they meet. And then you draw more and more squares on top of that until they separate. And then you'd eventually have a block letter K. And this method, simple as it may be, is pretty much exactly how fused deposition modeling or FDM printers work, which make up like 90% of the printers that hobbyists use. Now, the sharp among you may be wondering, what happens if you try to print a capital C and you get to that bit that overhangs that has nothing to attach to? Or what happens if you try to print a capital V and there's really nothing to stick to the table? Well, keep those in mind because we'll get back to them later. Regardless, in the printer's case, instead of a hot glue gun tip, it has this hot end here that heats and melts this spool of filament instead of a stick of glue. Instead of your finger pushing a trigger that moves things through, there's a motor attached to a gear. And instead of your arm moving it, there are three motors to move the print head anywhere it needs to go. And of course, as you would imagine, there are more things which make a 3D printer a bit more sophisticated than a monkey with a glue gun, like the fact that the bed has a heater in it to help the material stick more easily, or how there's a fan here to make sure the filament doesn't get too hot, melt early, and stick to the tube, or a fan down here to make sure the extruded plastic cools and hardens immediately so it stays exactly where it needs to be on a print. Some printers have a lot fancier features like beds that automatically level themselves or sensors that detect if you run out of filament or multiple spools so they can print multiple different colors on the same print at the same time. But what I described here is what you'll find on the vast majority of consumer level hobbyist 3D printers. But while this is all fine and good, it does beg the actual question, how exactly do you print something? Well, this is the part of the video where I explain how something goes from an idea in my head to a thing in my hand. To me, there are two ways to use a 3D printer. For art, where you can print things that look cool, and for practical use, where you can print things that serve a purpose. And while I definitely will be using this for art, I'm gonna be walking you through exactly how I use my 3D printer to solve problems. The first step, of course, is to identify a problem that you want to solve. And in my case, I want to hang these swords of mine up. If you didn't know, I do kendo, which is basically the Japanese samurai sport. And for it, I own this shinai, which is used in actual matches. And I own this bokuto, which is used for practice swings. The thing is, right now, I just kind of keep them back there, leaning up against the wall in the corner. And if I'm not careful, they easily slide and fall down. So I want to make myself a hanger so I can put them up. The most important question is, is 3D printing a hanger for these the best way for me to solve this problem? And for me, the answer I think is yes. Now there are tons of problems that a 3D printer is just not suited to solve, but in this case, I need a small part that won't be subjected to a lot of force. And since it's such a small cramped space, I need something exactly to my specifications. Specific items like these are perfect for 3D printing. Now, I know how to design things like this myself, but worry not if you don't. There are absolutely places that I will include links to in the description that have thousands upon thousands of pre-made objects ready to be printed. But I do want to include this in the video because it is an important part of the process, even if you're not the one doing it. After measuring everything up and sketching it all out, I drafted it up in Fusion 360. Now this right now is not in a language that the printer can understand. So if I gave this to the 3D printer right now, it wouldn't even know how to read it. So the first step in translating into something that it can read is to export it as an STL file. And basically what that is, is it turns it into a hollow object 
which makes it easier to process, which you'll see in a moment. So now that we've got our solid object, we throw it into a slicing software like Cura. Now, if you're someone who isn't going to draft their own things and is downloading something off the internet, chances are you're downloading an STL file and then you're tossing it in here. And the slicing software's job is to turn your 3D object into something that the printer can understand and therefore print. And the reason it's called a slicing software is because it takes your object and slices it into layers, which is really easy for your printer who builds it layer by layer to understand. Now there are tons and tons of settings that you can change by default and even more that are hidden that you don't see that you can fiddle around with. So if you want to use just the built-in presets, no shame in that. But I do want to talk about some things that are very important when it comes to 3D printing settings like these. One of the most important settings to change is the infill. If you'll remember, STL files are hollow, so we need to dictate how much plastic is put inside. So right here, we're at 20% infill. And you can see this grid zigzag thing in the middle. Now you can increase or decrease that number to change how much of these zigzags are inside. And increasing the number of course makes the part stronger, but it also makes it take longer. So right now we're at nine hours. And if we change it to 50% infill, well, you can see there's a lot more of these zigzags in there, but now it's 11 hours. Another important setting is the support material. If you look at this C from earlier, we established that there's a lot of overhang and printers don't do too well at that given that it does things layer by layer from bottom to top. So if you look at this red stuff here, that marks where we're gonna need support. And if we hit the preview, sure enough, it adds this support material in blue, which supports the overhanging bits and then easily snaps off once we're done printing. And if we look at our capital V problem, even though it has no need of supports, it's still only barely sticking to the print bed at this one little spot. So what we can do is change the settings for build plate adhesion. This one, I chose to have a brim. And if we preview it, now we got this blue brim that will help make sure the V doesn't fall over during printing. Of course, the best thing for both of these would just be to, you know, turn them 90 degrees and lay them flat, but you get the idea. Anyway, so what the slicing software is doing is it's taking the settings you've given it along with the SDL file, and it's using those to generate a G-code file, which is essentially just a string of instructions for the printer in order to tell it how hot to get, where to go, and when to extrude plastic. Okay, so that was a lot of information. In summary, a 3D modeling software is used to make an object. That object is exported as an STL file, which is basically a hollow version of that object. The STL file is then loaded into a slicing software where the user can decide exactly how they want it to be printed. It's then exported as a G-code file, which is a set of instructions for the printer to follow. It's then loaded onto a printer. The printer follows the instructions and then bam, you've got yourself a thing. And then you test it out and hope to God that it works. Here goes nothing. I am so glad that worked, you have no idea. Now, the only thing left is to hope the command strips decide to stay. But the cool thing about 3D printing is, even if that did fail, it's pretty cheap to print a new one. Like, for example, this bunny was around 20 cents or so, and that's it. And on that note, let's talk about some of the other great things that come with owning a 3D printer. The biggest thing for me, of course, is that you can print pretty much whatever you want. Granted, the type of printer you have dictates how big it could be or how detailed it can get, but the fact that you can take something from your imagination and put it into reality is absolutely amazing. And due to the layer by layer method of 3D printing, you can actually print some things in place with joints that you wouldn't be able to do with other methods like uh, injection molding or something like that. But while those reasons are great and I do love them, there are a lot of downsides that also come with owning a 3D printer. Now, these problems will vary in intensity depending on what kind of printer you own, but they will most likely be there to some degree regardless of what printer you own. They can be loud. The one I had in America had especially squealy motors. Luckily, the one I got here in Japan doesn't really, but there is a fan that is pretty loud that actually doesn't turn off ever. I need to look into that. They're also really slow. This rabbit took two hours to print. The hanger took 10 and longer, bigger prints can take literal days, plural. 
if you use some of the nastier plastics, they can get pretty stinky slash noxious as well. Luckily, PLA, which is pretty much the main one people use, is fine from what I can understand. So that's good. They're also not as reliable as I would like. Even my low-end printer back home could do and did do days-long prints, but the amount of modifications and maintenance I had to do on it was more than I would have liked to expect. I ended up becoming intimately familiar with exactly how my printer worked, which was cool, but if you're someone who just kind of wants to buy a tool and have it just work, well, you might be shelling out for a higher-end machine. And that layer-by-layer -layer process I was touting earlier means that there are built-in fault lines between the layers. So you can't really make super strong parts, and you need to keep this in mind when making things that will take some force. For example, if I had printed my hangers facing upwards instead of facing sideways like I did, the fault lines would have been in line with the actual hangers and it would have been really easy to break. And finally, ironically, while you now have the ability to create pretty much whatever you like, it is really easy to go crazy and make so much crap that you have nothing to do with that just clutters your house for the rest of time. So with all these downsides in mind, should you get a 3D printer? And to that I say, well, I kind of think getting a 3D printer is like getting a dog. Yes, there are a lot of downsides and a lot of responsibilities you have to take on if you want to get one. But if you know that going in and you know enough to be able to take care of those responsibilities, the benefits can pay off immensely. But if you don't know what you're getting yourself into and you're not prepared and you don't know how to handle the responsibility, well, there's going to be some regret involved. Luckily, though, the printer will not suffer if you neglect it. So there is that. So if you are looking into buying one, my biggest piece of advice is to do your research. I watched hours and hours of YouTube videos about 3D printing and 3D printer reviews before I bought my first one. And even then, the one I got had a manufacturing oversight, which allowed it to break itself after like a few hundred hours of printing, which I kind of was expecting going into it because that's what happens when you buy a lower end machine in an industry that is still developing. Unfortunately, my experience with a wide variety of printers is extremely limited. And like I said before, the consumer 3D printing industry is still developing super quickly. So I don't really feel I have the expertise to give you a recommendation of what you should start out with. And even if I did, it would probably become obsolete in a few months time. <laughs> However, if you've done the research and you're thinking about buying a 3D printer, I would recommend to go for a smaller, cheaper, lower end one, one that you don't feel afraid to mess around with and experiment with and figure out how it works. Then once you've figured out what exactly you want and you got the experience, you can go on ahead and buy a higher end one that you probably won't break now that you have the practice. And that's the long and short of it. I've gathered a bunch more knowledge and experience about 3D printing over the years, but most of it is really case specific and I don't think a lot of it will entertain the general watcher of my channel. So I think I shall call it there. Of course, if enough people are interested in more of a deep dive into 3D printing, feel free to let me know in the comments below. I am not opposed to making one if people want to see it. And if you've got any questions, you can, of course, swing by my Twitch. I am always open to talking with chatters about pretty much anything. And if you want to see me make more cool stuff with my printer, drop a sub. I will definitely be using it in my videos in the future. But until then, see you next week. Bye.